favorite group of high school students down at Kidron Central Christian High School as I oversee a mini term um, down there. We are putting together a student-led musical theater performance in two weeks. So it's a big deal for the students. They're working together to do this. I'm just there, the voice of reason, whatever. <laughs> That's besides the point. But as we started to work on the first day, they started discussing, okay, how are we gonna turn this choir room into a small performance space? It's a choir room, what are we going to do to it? So the first thing that came to the mind, their minds, they looked up and they're like, we have got to do something about these fluorescent lights that are kind of really bright and not pleasing to your eye, and you're not gonna watch the whole performance in that space. So, all of a sudden someone said, lamps. So, okay, what do you mean, whatever. So they said, we need lamps. We need all different kinds of lamps. People, everyone start bringing in a lamp every day. I don't care what it looks like, we just need lamps. Okay, so now, scattered all around the room, Every day, there's an addition to this collection. There are tiny desk lamps, there's big floor lamps, big table lamps, little desk lights, small candle lights, just all different kinds of lights. So now when the big fluorescent lights are off, we have this nice, glowing, cozy area, peaceful and the perfect setting. So every day as they're working, bear with me, because I think outside the box, all I've been thinking about all week is lamps. So I walk around the room, I'm arranging lamps, I'm plugging in lamps, taking out lamps, whatever with lamps. So this week, this is strange, think of yourself as a lamp, if you would. And think of everyone you come across as a different kind of lamp. Because no matter the shape, height, style, brightness, bulb, whatever, right? We are all shining our unique light, just like each one of these lamps all around the room. They're serving the perfect purpose. So I just can't stop thinking about lamps. So let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Matthew 5, 15 to 16. No two lights are the same. Light isn't something you do, it's something you are. So be who you are, go where you go. Let God be God, and he'll take care of the shining. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this day uh, you've given us and for all the people gathered here this morning. Um, thank you for lamps and just the reminder they gave to me this week, I was, I was thinking about today just um, that we each shine in a different way and are shining for you and um, spreading your word and your light to all those um, that we come in contact with. So just pray for a great week and that we'll just shine for you this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Kelly. And, uh, let's start and sing together.
Enrich us and deepen us, Lord Jesus, as we raise our hallelujah.
have power because of his great love for us. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, you've given us emotions and you've given us passions. Help us to channel those emotions and those passions for you. Our weapon is ability. See these thoughts in our minds, Lord, as we sing together. We have great power in your presence, Lord, because of your love. How deep that love is. And so, Lord, we give back to you right now. We give back in our praise and our worship, our focus and our attention. And yes, Lord, indeed, our life. We give back that which you bless us with. It's all because of you and for you and in you that we give. Be with this offering, multiply it, and bless it. Your great good in our world, on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. How deep the Father's love.
one person or two people um, up here this morning. Um, the team or the group of people standing before you, we are missing um, Matt and Jen Yoder. They are also part of this group. Um, they are here today though. So, um, there is a small individual, yes, for Terry and I, um, about a year ago, we said yes to um, leading this team. And this team is called the CARE Team. Um, and so this, I said yes, is a little bit more about who the CARE Team is and what the CARE Team does. Um, so let me just hear it. Okay. I'm Joanne. This is Terry. For anybody, we don't, we, we never know. Somebody may not know. Larry and Lois Raymer and Matt and Jen Yoder, I think, are trying to get up here. They'll get up here. Um, this care team was put in place several years ago to assist the pastors and the elders of meeting some of the physical needs um, of the church body in the surrounding community. Um, some of our duties might include um, organizing the meal chains when somebody has a new baby um, or there's a sickness or there's an illness and we can come alongside them and support them um, by providing a meal. Um, we might be called to ask if somebody, a family might be moving to a new house we might be called and asked to organize a team of people to um, help that family um, carry boxes and, and so forth. Um, another often thing that comes up is helping with financial needs within the congregation or outside. You may have noticed once in a while in the Bible, or in the Bible, in the bulletin, there is, in the bulletin, there might be a breakdown of the offering for the last week. Um, and you may see something called the Compassion Fund. If you haven't been around here very long, you may say, well, what do they do with that money? Um, we are the managers and the stewards of that Compassion Fund. Um, so somebody within our own day spring family might be going through a difficult time financially. Um, they might need help with a utility bill. They might need help with rent for that month. They might need um, extra food. They might need a car repair. This could be one of our own day spring families or this may be somebody that somebody else in one of our day spring family knows um, that there's a need, or it could come from a cold, what I will call community help, or a cold call. <coughs> so that we are a church, and people in need will call a church when they are in need. So we try to be the hands and feet in that situation of Jesus, <coughs> and trying to help discern whether or not, as a team, it's not one person saying, yeah, we're going to help this person, but not this person. We discern, as a team, whether or not this is something God has called us to do. Now, in the case of helping a community member, we want to be able to help them and be those hands and feet of Jesus, but there's always an invitation to come to a Wednesday night meal, to come to um, a service so that we can build a relationship with them. Um, and, and instead of just meeting their need <coughs> physically, most likely there's probably a spiritual need that needs to be met as well. This is all done very discreetly. If, it, if, if anyone in the congregation knows of somebody in need or has need of themselves, it's not, it, it's something that's very discreet. Even anonymous, if necessary. We also, our care team also works very closely with Lorraine Broad and her blessed ministry. 
um, will help organize yard help for someone who's not able to keep up on their own. Um, we also support some of the work that Lorraine does at Springer. Uh, in addition, um, in helping Lorraine, one thing um, that we could, are starting to try to um, build a little bit of a visitation team. We have some people who would benefit from having someone visit them on a monthly basis or a weekly basis, whether it's at Springer, helping Lorraine there, um, or in somebody's home. Um, so if you would have, this is an invitation, if you have that interest, if you feel God is <clears throat> calling you to go sit with somebody and talk with them, have conversation for half an hour or an hour, once in a while, let one of us know. Um, just a different way to be the hands and feet of Jesus. So that's a little bit about what we do. Um, we are asked when we do this, when you say yes, uh, in this segment here, um, how can you be praying for this team and for us individually? Um, I think just discerning when we are to help and what that help is to look like. Is it financial help? Um, is it physical help? How much financial help um, should be needed, should be given? So that's the one way that you could be praying for us. Um, so yeah, that's the care team. Um, please, we just want to make sure you saw our faces, know our name, if there is a need, or you know of somebody um, that could be helped. Um, we would like to, we would like to be able to see if we could, we could meet that need for somebody. It's just our second Sunday of the new year, right? A new theme for 2020 was introduced to us just last week. Does anybody recall, can you share which book of the Bible our theme is drawn from this year? Just call it out if you know. Colossians. Colossians. Anybody know chapter and verse? 127. Very good. And what is the very first word of this year's theme? Christ. That's right. Christ, familiar term for most of us, right? Um, but since it's the very first word of our, of our 2020 theme, I want us to be thinking straight. Christ is not Jesus' surname, right? It's not his last name. It's not like Jesus Steiner or Jesus Horner, right? Christ is it's a title, right? More accurate for us to say, very similar to Peter, to what Peter did when, when Jesus said, Who do you say I am? You're Jesus the Christ, right? He's saying you are the Savior, the Messiah. You're the anointed one. The world's hoped for since the beginning of time. Christ is a title. It is a title of the most high honor that there is. What do the next two words of our theme tell us about the Christ? 
Christ in you. In you. Yes, Christ lives inside all of Christians. Christ in you. I know um, some of you are probably subconsciously almost suppressing yawns as I say that. And it makes me wish that I could bring Simeon or, or Anna out of the Bible times and, and, and have them stand in front of us here telling us to wake up and to marvel at that reality because we know those two, right? They spent their entire lives going to the temple every day believing if they could just lay their eyes on the Christ one time, they could die a happy death. Their hearts would burst if you told them that, that the Christ would actually be living inside of people. It would be incomprehensible to Anna and Simeon that ever, anyone could ever be blasé about Christ living inside of us. Christ in you. And the last four words of our theme are the hope of glory. Of course there is hope, like we've talked about all through Advent season. And of course there is glory if the Christ is involved. Jim finished last week by saying, let this be the year of three things. Just giving you a just general review of the whole week. What are the three things this is to be a year of? Anybody? Celebration. Celebration. Multiplication. Anybody remember the third one? Glory. Yeah, glory revealed. Celebration, multiplication, and glory revealed. And it just seemed very fitting to us. Considering that theme, that we turn back to the Gospels to learn more of who the Christ is, um, how he came to live inside of us, and how and why his glory is revealed. So from now until at least the Easter season, we are going to study the Gospel that we've actually spent the least amount of time in through the years, preaching our way through here at Day Spring. The Gospel written by Peter's friend, by Paul's co-missionary, the Gospel according to Mark. So... Go ahead and open your Bibles, if you haven't already, to Mark chapter 1. We start a little series with the Gospel of Mark. We're going to start reading right in the middle of the first chapter, to find verse 14. Mark chapter 1, verse 14. There it says that now after John, speaking of John the Baptist, after he was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time's fulfilled and the kingdom of God's at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, and they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me. And I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired servants. And they followed him. So this morning, as we, as we connect what happens here in Mark 1 with, with our theme for the year, I want us to first of all notice it makes sense the Christ, right? Beginning of our of our theme, and we notice him in this story, and I want to look at some of his characteristics that he models for us that, that we are to be following. And we see first of all that the Christ, he wasn't derailed, that is, he didn't change course due to the threats. It's in the very first line that we read, it says after John the Baptist was arrested for preaching the gospel, what did Jesus do? He went right to Galilee and he preached the gospel, right? He was not scared. He was not setting his priorities based on what was safe, right? One of the exact same truths that we looked at as we were in Sunday school last week studying the parable of the Good Samaritan, right? Where you have two religious leaders in that story that didn't share the love of God because it didn't feel safe to them, right? It wasn't a comfortable decision to stop and help this bleeding man alongside the road because... The robbers might still be there, right? Maybe they're just behind the rocks hiding out of the way. And if, if I stop here to help, I might get robbed and beaten. Just like this guy that's laying there. I'm getting out of here, right? That was their response to threat. But God's teaching us both in that story and here in Mark 1 that God still needs Christians to share the good news in ways and in places that aren't safe. It may be where war and violence are still a very much present danger. He may ask you to share the good news on streets and in neighborhoods 
that aren't perfectly safe. Here's a dichotomy that I've seen. I've seen great Christians, some right here, who have known and lived sharing the gospel even when and where it wasn't safe. But then when their young adult children start to hear God's call and they start processing living and taking the good news where it's not safe and comfortable, those same parents who've taken risks for the sake of the gospel themselves sometimes have a really hard time giving their blessing and their counsel for their children now to go and be witnesses for Christ in areas that feel threatening. Danger and threats never made the Christ run away, not even one little bit. We also see Christ modeling here in Mark 1, obedience and spiritual disciplines. He didn't necessarily need to be baptized or receive the Holy Spirit in the exact same way we do, but he was still fully human, and he wanted to model important steps before he went to engage in his ministry, so we watch him receive baptism and the Holy Spirit and we're reminded these things are things we are to receive as well. In fact, in just this short passage here in Mark 1, we watch the Christ receive all three baptisms that the Bible mentions. It's in Matthew 3.11, which is a parallel uh, chapter to Mark chapter 1, that John the baptizer says, I'm baptizing you with water, but the Christ is going to come and he's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, some take the fire baptism to be talking about Judgment Day because John was talking about Judgment Day. Some take it to mean the tongues of fire that appeared on Pentecost. But I think in the context and the sentence structure that John's using, and as we look at the rest of Scripture, I think it's pointing towards this baptism of fire being God's refining fire. The Bible explains in James 1 and other places that trials and hardships that we're pretty quick to, to pass off as either bad luck or, or maybe Satan's attacking us. We're, we're taught there in James 1 that it's often actually a refining fire that God is using to burn away impurities in us. Just as precious metals are exposed to great heat to burn away what's called the dross so that we are left with the purity and the, the pure beauty of, of the gold or the silver, so too God sends Christians at times through a baptism of fire to free us from impurities and to make us more beautiful representa representations of the Christ. Amen. We also see in this story Christ longing for kingdoms, don't we? Right? He goes through these three baptisms before he launches into his ministry. And then what's the first thing we see him do as he's starting his ministry? He finds some teammates, right? Tremendous counsel for us as we are setting off into ministry. Josh and Noemi Chavez spoke at our pastor spouse meeting um, the last February we were down in Florida, and, and all of us who were at Regen a couple summers ago got to hear Noemi. They said about their large ministry in California to us last February, we don't have anybody do anything by themselves. Everything we do involves teammates. Now, Jesus is the only one who ever walked the earth that, that could have done some great ministry by himself, and yet his very first ministry step is what? I'm going to surround myself with some good teammates. That is the Christ. That is some of the things we watch him role modeling for us. But our thing doesn't just say Christ, right? It says Christ in you. And Mark 1 shows us some of God's purposes for coming to reside inside of Christians. So I want us to dwell a little bit on Jesus' very familiar first words to his teammates, to the disciples who model for us now how we are to be Jesus' disciples. So let's linger with Jesus' familiar words in Mark chapter 1, verse 17, if you look at it. First thing he says to his teammates, and the first two words of it are very short, he just says, follow me. Follow me. It's to the point. It's simple to understand. Crystal clear. Super challenging to execute and unending in, in the depths of what it might mean for your life and me. Follow me. That is what our I Said Yes segment is all about, right? It is stories of, of just this regular day springers following the Christ. Stories of Jesus saying, I want you to come follow me 
to this new place and day springers maybe swallowing harvest saying, okay, yes, I will follow you there. And what have we learned as we've listened to all of these stories? We've learned Jesus' invitations to follow him rarely sound safe, right? It is almost always scary. It's almost never the thing that we would choose to do if we were just choosing what comes natural or what comes easy. Following the Christ isn't safe, but it is inherited in the stories. It's always good. It's always good. The call from Jesus to follow me is for every single Christian. It's why Pam said last week after her, I said yes. She just needed to pray for all of us because every single one of us, she said, ought to be able to stand up and tell an I said yes story because Jesus is expecting all of his disciples to follow him into impacting the big K kingdom of God. Jesus said, follow me. And then he said, as you follow me, I will make you become. Right? Super interesting and something every Christian needs to have a grip on. Being a follower of Jesus is no joke. It is not fluff. It's not, I'm going to go to church on Sunday and try and read my Bible and be a good person. Nuh uh. No. I'm allowing for everyone, even our youngest children that are here, to understand this. Following Jesus will turn your life upside down. Amen. Following Jesus at times is going to make your head spin. Following Jesus will change everything. Yeah. Jesus yeah. said, Follow me, and know that if you do, I, the Christ, am going to make you. Something new, something different, something better. If you follow me, I will make you become. Do you want to become something new and improved? Not just improved, transformed. Like Cinderella and, and her pumpkin were, were changed in this beautiful princess and this beautiful chariot. This is what the Bible says Christ does when we follow him. Got two different verses up here. One's, first one's from the Old Testament. Isaiah said, Forget the former things. Don't dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it's springing up. Do you perceive it? I'm making a way right through the dry wilderness. I'm bubbling up streams where there was wasteland. Very similar principle in the New Testament. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, and if you're in Christ, we're remembering this year, he's in you. And if you're in Christ, behold, you're a new creation. The old is, is passed away. It's dead. It's gone. Behold, the new has come. <clears throat> the Christ invites us to follow him even when it's scary. And he says if we do, he will make us become something new, something better. And yet the Christ was very specific about one of the things. He says he will always make those who follow him become. Follow me, and I will make you become what? Fishers of men. Fishers of men. Think about it. Every single I said yes story we have had of following Christ, of saying yes to him, all of them has involved fishing for people. Some way of reaching out to people who need Jesus. <coughs> Care ministry we heard about this morning is fishing for finding people to bless in Jesus' name. Pam last week is finding her voice to tell people about Jesus. Lorraine is a fisher of people at the Springer home to help them know and grow in Jesus. Rex's music box is reaching out to people all over the world in Jesus' name. Isaac and Crystal are fishers of people for Jesus through Amplifriday, and I could go through everyone I didn't already mention. <coughs> Of those stories, the Christ says, follow me and I will make you become fishers of people. Fishers of people. I touched on this last Sunday after Pam shared, but I need to say it again today. There's only a few of you here among us that have known my sister-in-law, Pam Bar Bartholomew, as long as I have. I've known the Pam that was very efficient, very capable, very committed and active in the cause of Christ, and yet still very convinced that her role was in the background, right? That's her job to be behind the scenes, disdaining any invitation to ever speak in front of anyone. I've known that Pam, 
And I know some of the pieces of her story that happened even before I knew her, that she touched on a little bit of, of the young girl that was already subconsciously starting to believe lies about not being qualified and not good enough that fed her adult belief that she belonged right back there in the background quietly. When I watched her stand in front of all of us yesterday, last Sunday, <coughs> literally radiating confidence, right? And clarity and boldness with fire. And God's downloaded word pouring out of her, I felt in my spirit as I'm watching her, I'm literally watching the hope of glory. I'm watching it. I'm watching it. Pam's transformation displays the glory of God. She had yet said yes to Christ's scary invitation to follow him. And before our eyes, we are watching her become a fisher of men. And as we watch Pam's transformation, we are watching the glory of God. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. That makes sense? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I am watching our 2020 theme unfold before my eyes as I watch Pam's ongoing transformation. Christ in you, and it's the hope. Glory. We're watching it with our eyes. And so too we watch this, the glorious beginnings of the disciples' transformation in Mark chapter 1. And we see the final stages of their transformation in the book of Acts, where we watch Peter and others just fearlessly preaching the gospel with threats on their lives, right? But the beginnings of the glory, they're right here. We see that the hope of the glory and the disciples' response to Christ's invitation to follow him. I want you to look at their response one more time in, in verse 17. Because I think it's glorious. Jesus said the words we were looking at, verse 17, follow me and I'll make you become fishers of men. Glorious. Immediately, they left their nets and they followed him. That's glorious. Their response was immediate. There's at least one term from a theme that's now a couple years ago that just doesn't go away for us here at Dayspring, right? You know what it is. Quick obedience, right? Quick obedience. It doesn't imply recklessness or carelessness. It doesn't imply not ever counting the cost. It does imply saying no to the tentacles of fear. It does imply placing obedience over excuses. It does imply my eyes locked forward rather than looking back. It does imply courage. Quick obedience. The Christ said, follow me, and he just did it immediately. In their quick obedience, it says in verse 18, they left behind their nets, right? Mm -hmm. When you say yes to following God, you will almost always be required to leave something behind. Sometimes you need to leave behind baggage or even sin and lies. But sometimes we need to leave behind the familiar, which may have been neutral or even good. These disciples left behind their jobs and their homes and their, their family patterns, much of, which, much of which had been fine. But the Christ had something better, and so they left it behind. I am never going to forget Joe and Ruby's leaving for Africa, even though it's now some 20 years ago. I remember a huge auction. Joe sold all of his tools. His tools. That had been... In many ways, not really, but in lots of ways, his identity. He sold lumber that he and his father had milked together years before. They got rid of most of their belongings. They rented their house and left to share Jesus in Africa for three years. And what they left behind was good. They missed the birth and the adoption of several of their grandkids. They left behind a great situation and a family that loved them. But they said yes to something even better. The invitation and the plans of God. And so must every one of us, time and time again, as he invites us. God didn't waste Joe and Ruby's experiences that they had before that. He incorporated Joe's carpentry skills and Ruby's teaching and loving and organizational skills that they developed before God's called them to Africa. And God used and blessed those skills in the new thing that he had designed for them to walk into. Pam said this last week. I went back and watched it again so I'd get it right. 
things we've done in the past are training for what we're about to do in the future. We see the very same thing in the disciples in this story, right? Now, some of us know all too well, sometimes God asks us to do something that we have no skill or experience in, right? So that our testimony at the end is, look what God's done, because I couldn't have done it and have any, any skills in that area. Rex is always telling about the irony of what he would call a completely non-musical person being asked to lead up the music box ministry, right? Doesn't have any music skills, he says. We'll see. <laughs> but the ministry also needs a visionary, right? And it needs an organizer. And it needs a plan executioner, right? Rex had all of those skills developed, right? Isn't it like God to create his first fishers of men from fishermen, right? Like Pam said, things we've done in the past are training for what we're about to do in the future. God doesn't waste our experiences. does not waste our experiences. I've got a degree in science. And I know that none of that training and study was wasted even though my career turned out to be a pastor. You can rest assured, no matter how stuck in a rut you feel right now, no matter how much you may hate your job, no matter how clueless you may feel about what's your purpose right now, God isn't wasting what you're going through right now. He's not. The things that have been happening or maybe feel like they're not happening in your life right now, God's using as training for what he's going to call you to do. When God gives you your next follow me orders and you say yes with quick obedience, at some point in your becoming a fisher of men in new ways, you're going to be able to realize and look back how God was using your past experiences with what's going on right now. Because the time felt pointless, useless, what's going on. You're going to look back and see, ah, oh, I see how he used what felt like at the time what's going on. And as the rest of us watch the Christ making you become a new created fisher of men, we will have the privilege of seeing once again Christ in you. The hope of glory in you. Now most of this week, I've been a cold virus carrier. Some of you lately have been carriers of the flu. And we know the routine, right? I've been in it for a while. And we're carrying a virus like that. Stay away from people, right? I'm going to shake hands, I'm going to touch people, because if I get too close, they're going to catch what I'm carrying, right? I love Jim's term that he shared with us last week. What did he say? We are what carriers? Glory carriers. We're glory carriers. We're glory carriers. If anyone gets too close to us, they should catch the glory virus, right? caught it when you watched Pam last week, right? You didn't have to be right, right beside her. She's a glory carrier, amen? Yes, she is. She's a glory carrier. <coughs> I don't want to infect people with my cold, but I sure do want to infect them with God's glory that I am carrying. This week's Tuesday tune-up mail email introduced the challenge. I'm going to bring it up again this morning. We were asking that email. Would you, all of us, consider praying a simple prayer every morning in 2020 before you get out of bed, I think it was phrased. I know some of you can't even put two thoughts together before you're out of bed and have a cup of coffee. doesn't necessarily have to be before you climb out of bed. But would you commit to daily praying this prayer to start your day, every day of 2020? God, appoint me to show your glory to somebody today. Print it in the bottom of your outline if you want to remember it. I'm going to ask you in a minute if you want to stand and commit to praying that prayer daily in 2020. But before I do that, let me just say ahead of time, if you don't stand, nobody's going to read into it that you're less committed or, or uh, that you care less. You might be a slow processor. You may carry a passion to, to, to not commit to something until you determine you are all in. There's a thousand good reasons you may not stand during this prayer, so no worries at all if you don't. But some of you know God's speaking to your heart in 2020 with the idea I'm a glory carrier. And it maybe rubs against uh, the humble ways you were taught to, to think about yourself in Christ. 
But the idea of displaying God's glory to others as, as you say yes to following God or, or just the faithful way you live your life or, or by maybe looking for ways to, to speak to the people that are around you instead of never making eye contact with the stranger. Some of you just know this prayer assignment is for you in 2020. God appoint me to show your glory to somebody today. And I long for us to, to have to, uh, to have stories in our sharing time after messages this week of, of somebody saying, this is how God appointed me to show, show his glory to somebody. I just had this conversation I didn't plan. I just bumped into this person and I, and I talked to him and when I was, when I was finished, I, I realized I, I kind of had I showed them God's glory in, in the conversation. Some of these glory, these glory reveals, we're never going to know, right? You're going to just have uh, been around someone and just the way you carried yourself, the way you responded to something, they're going to have seen God's glory in how you handled that. And you will never know it this side of heaven. But I'm asking, I'm standing this year uh, with this prayer. God appoint me to show your glory to somebody today. Commit to pray that every morning. Anybody else wants to do that? If I should stand up, I'm going to just close this with a prayer. Um, a blessing for anybody that's that's doing that again. You're still processing, that's fine. Um, I may probably just end up praying for all of us, whether we're, whether we're standing or not. So, so pray with me. Lord, um, it really is a, a, a different way of thinking for some of us. We just acknowledge that. Some of us have been raised in a church all of our life and, and taught about um, taught to be humble, taught to be quiet, taught to be uh, gracious. Um, and it, it, it takes really some new thinking to, to, to think about I'm a glory carrier and, and, and not struggle to think about the me in that story. You know, we, we know it's not about us, Lord. Um, and so it takes some, some, some thinking of, of how I can be a glory carrier and have it not be about me at all. Um, We've talked, I just think of that illustration, I think Karen's led us through it, how, you know, we're we're like uh, crack pots, not a crack pot, but pots with crack in them, and those cracks are what the, the flaws of the different things, the past stuff we've dealt with are some of the ways some, that you most often, that your glory shines out of us. Um, so Lord, help all of us as we, as we continue to process this theme for 2020 get to the place where we can just fully embrace me with all of who I am right now, all of what I've been, all of what I long to be in the future, but me right now, because you live in me, I can show your glory to anybody that I need. And so, Lord, we are just asking, just like Kelly's illustration was this morning, that this light of ours inside us would shine. And that your glory, that people would literally come to believe in you differently, to, to receive you as Christ, to, to, to embrace you just because they saw your glory coming out of all of us. Um, we pray that the kingdom would change. Lord, I don't know how, what is there, 130 of us here maybe this morning? 130 of us going out and showing your glory to one person for the next six days. Come back together again. That is so hard. Getting to see the glory of God. And it is the hope of glory. And we talked about it all during Advent. If there's one thing that people around us need, it is to have hope. And the reason there is hope is because of your glory. And we carry it. And we just ask that you would um, lead us to, to start our day in 2020 asking for that. Divine appointments that you have set up. That somebody who needs to see your glory would see it pouring out of us for your glory's sake. And Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. <coughs> it is our time for the Unity Circle. So yeah, the music team can come on up. And those that are going to be serving can come on up. Uh, if you haven't taken communion with us before, let me just explain a little bit how, we, how we'll be doing that. Yeah. Um, after I um, pray.
pray for us one more time. You can come up through these two sides, through these rows in the middle, and receive uh, the bread and the juice from the people who will be serving, uh, serving it to you. Um, we have uh, gluten-free option two. The crackers up here are all gluten-free. That is an issue for you as well, so you can participate. Uh, the table is open for anybody that loves Jesus. Um, you can come and celebrate being a part of his family. Uh, you are, the table is, is wide open and welcome for you. After we receive the elements, it is our tradition to then file on to the outside of this room, and we will make a big, what we call a unity circle, celebrating the unity that we have in Christ. So find your way, um, uh, whether you take communion or not, find your way to the outside uh, row where we'll stand together in our unity circle. Um, we also have uh, grapes and crackers provided for, for the children that are too young to have made a decision for Christ yet so they can come up and, and, and celebrate with their family as well. We remember that Jesus said, every time you do this, while you're doing it, remember me. Right? In his order, as he shared it with his disciples, every time for the rest of history, when you take the bread and the cup, Remember me. And he's clearly, his primary reference was always remembering his work on the cross, right? Remembering he shed his blood and he, and he died so that he might live. But I'd also say this morning, as you're standing in line, or after you've taken communion, you're waiting for everybody else to take it, I'd also ask you to remember that Jesus and that sacrifice on the cross, remember that he bled and died so that he could come and live inside each one of us. And he wanted to live inside of us so that his Holy Spirit could continue to call us to courageously follow him. And Jesus calls us so that as we follow him, we become something new. Fishers of men in new ways. And that whole process he began by dying on the cross for you and me was largely so that his disciples through the ages would say yes to following him and becoming fishers of men. And as we do that, we would one by one reveal his glory to everyone around us for his name's sake. That's why, to a large extent, he bled and died for us. And so, as you remember what he did, remember some of the purposes he had in doing that on the cross for you, that you would be one that would be a glory carrier that just where you go, you would testify of the glory of God. Remember that purpose for your life as you as you take communion this morning. Let me just let me just bless our uh, the communion that we share. Oh, we truly do share it in your name. <clears throat> and I just pray that everyone that that comes up to this table would have our minds and our thoughts on the price you pay. That you truly were not scared. Threats uh, didn't make you head in the opposite direction in any way. Even what was more than the threat of dying on the cross for us. And so Lord, we just remember that as we as we celebrate communion this morning. But we remember you had purposes for doing that. Purposes that impact what we are to do the rest of today and tomorrow and the day after that. Of taking your glory to people that, that need to know and grow in you. And so we celebrate this communion in remembrance of you, Jesus. It's in his name that I pray.
As long as I can remember, the invitation has always been as we gather in this position to take a look around. And acknowledge who all is in the circle. Knowing that it probably has never been and probably will never be the exact same again. <coughs> what a gift each person that is here is. So just invite you to do that and celebrate. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, and some of them are buying perfect gifts here, other than that it's designed by God, but these are good gifts. Um, we are still, just, just to acknowledge, we are still in that transition, of, as even as we adjust the timing of our, of our order of service here on a Sunday morning to, to try and have the, the prayer requests happen in Sunday school time rather than here. Just if you didn't hear in Sunday school this morning, additional steps were taken to make sure that we still hear everything that needs to be prayed for is that they'll be, we'll be introducing a new uh, Wednesday Warrior email that will come out reminding us all of what was shared in prayer requests in Sunday school time. Anything that didn't get shared there that, that you get to the, to the pastors and elders, we will have on that, that prayer list so that, so that we are praying. Um, so just know that that is happening. But one of the ways to, one of the reasons to do that is to continue to give us an opportunity in moments like this to really, uh, really process what the Lord has said to us this morning throughout everything that's happened. And so I just want to give you opportunity to, to speak to that. Is there, uh, is God working with you personally in a way to, to change your thoughts so that you can embrace that you are a glory carrier? What does that look like for you? Are you, uh, do you have the spontaneous I said yes story to share where, uh, where God gave you a scary invitation maybe just in the last few weeks that you could share here what that looked like to say yes to it. Um, uh, anything else that, that God was, was saying or doing this morning that you would that you would be uh, able to reflect on together to help us process that together? That would be the time to share that. We do have mics to try and help us here. Mark's got one, I see. Courageous enough to speak into that. Because none of us belong to